In uh, this Fundamentals of Mixing, lesson number nine, we're going to take a look at uh, session organization. And uh, so this is just kind of preparing some of the tracks and, and setting up the session so that when we actually start digging into the actual mix, mixing and processing, the things are organized in a way that, that um, make it functionally uh, easier to work with. So in putting together something like this, one of the things that uh, always happen in con inside of sessions working in on SSL consoles or Neve consoles or any large format audio console, analog consoles or digital, is that there would be some form of organization or color coding that would go on. There would be some organization of the tracks, de determining what elements belong together and how they should be paired. Um, so there are certain things that I do and I'll, I'll point out what I do and also point out, you know, other approaches that people might have to working with things. One thing that I almost always do, for example, is I always put my bass next to the kick drum. And in putting the bass next to the kick drum, what I end up doing with that and the reason why I end up doing that is that most of the time they end up working together. Now, this is a habit that carries over from, you know, if you're on an analog desk, it's nice to be able to see the EQ side by side or the compression settings side by side or having them right next to each other. So as I'm balancing the two of them, I can do so with one hand as I reach over, you know, with just uh, my first two digits and kind of balance out the kick and bass balance. If they're on separate sides of the arrangement, that's harder to do. Now, in a DAW, of course, the beauty is that you can move things around and all that. On an analog desk, you would cross patch. So the multi-track would have the tracks recorded in whatever was available at the time. You know, so sometimes things get jumbled around and mixed up, but part of the session was reorganizing everything so that the tracks would be laid out in a way that would allow the flow of the mix basically to, to happen in, in a simplified fashion. So in putting this together, um, I'm going to do a couple of elements or a couple of different things here. There's going to be some track organization. There's going to be some color coding, grouping of tracks that are connected or belong together, and... Um, and even setting up subgroups and then um, organizing the signal flow or preparation for uh, signal flow organization. So in the last lesson, what we talked about was determining the role of individual tracks. Are they, is it a rhythmic track? Is it a melodic track? Is it um, a harmonic track? Um, and what role does it actually play? Is it a lead instrument? Uh, a, a counter melody instrument, something that responds or answers to the vocal, something that supports the vocal, doubles the vocal, etc. And so in doing this, what we can do is we can organize things so that if you have, for example, lead vocal, you have a harmony part for the lead vocal or a double lead vocal double. Um, I don't put those with background parts if it's like a background hook, you know, so if, like if I if I look at this track here, I have a lead vocal part. It's very simple. It's just basically one lead vocal part and then there's a, a background part, but they're not necessarily, they're not singing the same thing and they're not singing at the same time. So to have them maybe in the same stem might not make sense um, or I want to separate them. So if all these vocals are split out over 10 or 12 tracks, I would keep those isolated and separated and, and put together from the lead vocal. But I don't consider like a double, lead vocal double, a background part, okay? It's a part that helps to supplement the power of the lead vocal or a harmony part that maybe comes in and does a harmony on certain words or certain phrases in the song. I'll mix those together with the lead vocal and have it next to them, okay? So as I go through the arrangement, there are some obvious things that are easy to group together. So let's just start by uh, kind of going through the basic arrangement here. And so I have kick and snare. Oh, I have this. So the the, uh, the the claps are more important than the snare in this. That really defines the backbeat a little bit better. So I'm going to have that track right next here, and then. And then this supplements this other snare track here, that reverse snare. I'm not sure if we'll keep that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then, so now we have some other secondary parts. This is like, uh, let's see. Okay, so rhythmically, this stick part that's here is actually doing something different. Right, so that's not following, although it looks like it's playing at the same time as those guys, it's coordinated with them. I'm gonna probably move the tambourine up here because that actually is more part of the total sound and that those three elements are playing all at the same time and they're playing together. And then this reverse snare kind of coordinates with all of those. And then this element here is rhythmically bouncing off of those guys. And I can figure out where to place that. Uh, there's also some, oh, there's also a rim shot here. Okay, so this element may play, uh, cause it's playing when the snare is not playing. Okay, so then this is also playing up against uh, up, up against uh, in the back of these other tracks. You could kind of organize this. I'm putting the reverse snare after. And we may not end up even using that, but all of that stuff kind of belongs together in some fashion or order. Uh, so I'll just kind of leave that there. We have the stick, which is playing off that. So this kind of works a little bit more into the percussion. So now usually what I'll do with uh, percussive elements is I'll put them after drum elements because this is not like a pure drum kit you know there are some issues um um with it because it, it's kind of playing off the snare and and it's not like a full like acoustic drum kit i guess is kind of what i'm saying where i might mix the whole drum kit in order and then mix in separate percussive elements a lot of the roles kind of conflict here and and kind of get mixed up but i'm going to keep the hi-hat um, which again is part of the rhythm, probably is going to play off of this stick part. And then uh, the hi-hat is split off into two elements here, and then the crash cymbals right after that. And then we got reverse cymbals. Now, this kick build, I'm not exactly sure. This probably... That's really, although it's a kick build it's like a click it's more of a percussive um effect type of thing so i have all the effects tracks here there's also a snare build over here which we didn't listen to before all right so that element is there and then we have some now we have the risers and and falls right okay and then we have the sirens over here so we have effect elements together now this is actually in an in-between thing because it's Because what this element is doing is rhythmic, but it's got a pitch. So I'm actually going to move this up more with the percussive elements because it's going to actually play more off of what's going on here with the hi-hats and that stick. and how we're going to play and make those guys all work together. So like in, in a in a quick thing uh, here, let's kind of just revisit this top here. What I have are uh, different, three different drum loops. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start uh, my organization here by just selecting a color. So these are, I can do the regions. I don't really care. That doesn't seem to bother me so much, the regions being different colors or not the same from each other. It actually kind of annoys me more when they're all the same. I don't know why, but um, but uh, I could do that with the, with it. But in the meantime, I'll kind of put all these guys together. And then I have a bass track, um, give the bass track a separate color. 
in there and then I can uh, work with all of the basic drum elements. I'm gonna work all the way up to, let's see, uh, I'll keep the reverse snare in there even though that's an effect. Stick, hi-hat, the effect vocals, and the crash cymbal. So I'm gonna keep all of those guys um, in there, give them like a separate color. This this actual, um, that vocal effect, because it's melodic, it may fall into a different thing, but you know, then there's a lot of percussion that is as melodic, like that has, you know, a tone or a pitch to it, like cowbells and things like that, uh, triangles, etc. cetera. Uh, these are all effect tracks. Okay, so on the effect side of things, I got that. Um, I'll give those guys another, uh, another color. I'm not sure. What do I want to do with effect tracks? Hmm. Good color for effect tracks? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll do something really hideously ugly. Uh, oh man. I'll just go with that for right now. That's, yeah, they actually should be like a lighter color or something like that. I'm going to spend, I'm going to waste 20 minutes actually just kind of going through colors. All right, I'm going to leave it right there for that, for for right now. And uh, maybe what I am going to do with these guys here is uh, is do uh, the clips uh, somewhat of the same color there so I can kind of keep them organized together. Uh, let's see, what else? Did I grab that extra one? I guess I did. That's all right. Um, and then I have guitars. Uh, guitar parts I always uh, put together. All these guitar parts are all kind of tied together. I almost you always use like a green for guitars, um, blue for keyboards. So uh, I got keyboard pad, keyboard hooks, strings. Um, I'm going to kind of keep that all in the keys category, including horns, and uh, just uh, put all of those guys together in some uh, more fashionable blue. I always put my lead vocal in red, uh, so we have that. Um, I have an ad lib there. I can also keep that ad lib as also a lead vocal part, do the background vocals in some kind of orange color or something like that. And now I have a basic, uh, I have a basic layout. I don't know why, I feel like these, maybe these should be like yellow or something like that. Yeah, I can, I can dig with that a little bit better. I can groove on that one a little bit better. All right, so let me just see if I can get those guys to to do that. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time. Maybe I'll do some of this other stuff in terms of the color coding of the regions and things like that, you know, uh, a little bit later. Um, but, uh, yeah, see, that just, like, makes just look like a big, like, all of the same kind of mess. But that's all right. Um, so then... From here, once we've kind of got this um, organized and color coded and mapped out, you can lay it out whatever way that you want to. Um, in terms of, you know, I usually start with bass and drums at the beginning through percussion, then work into guitars, keyboards after that, and then vocals on the far right. Um, and that's not necessarily ends up being the workflow that I go through. I can hide different areas and things like that, but I am going to start to create groups. Um, now, I, I purposely kind of um, created some uh, some groups here, all, you know, the same, you know. Uh, um, oh, here, hold on one second. I'm going to create one group, I'm sorry. That's going to be uh, called All Audio uh, Tracks, so I'll just kind of do that. Uh, and then I'm going to create some uh, groups here. This is going to be the loops, right? So, oops, I think I got a D in there looped kind of like that keep that and uh that's just bass uh we'll have drums right so that'll be uh drums what i'm going to do here is i'm going to keep like the the more uh the bigger groups as you know just as drums right there uh, these are going to be uh, a group because these are all uh, are going to be effects, right? So that's going to be all the reverse effects. Uh, I'm going to have a, um, a group here called guitars. I have a group here called keys, and uh, and then um, 
I'll have a, a group here called vocals, all right? So this gives me like some groups here with all vocals. Now, I may disable them all, which is fine because I can, you know, these are ones that I can enable as I need them. And you see that they're nested so that the all audio comes through and gives me every, um, every element. Uh, this comes in handy later on in the mix. If I look and I notice that the mix bus is slamming, I can kind of pull everything down at the same time. But as I kind of balance things, I'm going to kind of work with them. Now, interestingly, these two parts here um, basically are the same thing, kind of processed a little differently from each other. And so nested within this is uh, something that is called uh, drums with a Z and crunchy beat loop okay so um uh all right so i'm just going to call this i'll just create a group there with those two that i'm just going to call beat loop uh and so that one i'll probably keep enabled uh with this um let's see if i had multiple kick drums i would create a group for those guys uh, because none of these other guys really all tie together specifically, I'll save them and create them as groups together. The one exception would be hi-hats, because those two hi-hat parts uh, uh, kind of play together, uh, or they do play together. Let's see what else. All those effects are independent of each other. Uh, these two guitar parts are really obvious. All right, so those two guitar parts, um, uh, what am I going to call that? It's like a chorus guitars or something all right so the idea there is that um uh the idea there is i'm i'm trying to group some elements that i know are going to mix or blend or belong together as we're kind of going through this this i'm going to leave separate because um there is going to be some balancing here between the string pad and the keyboard pad and this not the roads chop not the synth lead, uh, or the horns. No, so those three elements here. Because like when you when you listen to this, they all belong together. I think that's, or, oh, hold on one second here. Hmm. That sounds suspicious. Uh, here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this and I'm just going to uh, phase invert that. Aha! A villain! So what just happened there? I found out that that part is an exact duplicate of what's in here. Um, cause I listened to it and it's like, those sound exactly the same. So why do I have that on a separate track? And so this is somehow compiled into this other track. Let me just see if there's a reason why. Interestingly, there's also a level change there. So that's compiled. So that's good. That means I can, uh, delete this track. Uh, or maybe I'll make that track inactive and I'll go ahead and I'll hide it while I'm doing that. Um, and, and then I can throw this down on the end and then that's one less track to deal with. If I, for some reason, feel like I need to separate out those two. So be careful, you know, like when you're putting things together like that, notice if things connect together. We talked a little bit about that with the guitars and, uh, and, uh, the organization on that end. All right. So I've done the grouping. One of the thing that... I want to talk about that's very important and uh i don't think it's necessarily uh important to kind of go through the track and do it but um right now you know just as a matter of course because it's just a technical exercise but understanding what the arrangement is like if if um and that's part of that is creating memory locations now in this with the beginning of the song let me go back to the beginning So uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to take this and uh, let me just see uh, time operation 
modes, uh, insert time. I'm just going to insert uh, length one bar and uh, keep the meter the same. Uh, move these guys over. Uh, Okay. Okay, so all I'm doing here is just inserting a bar at the beginning. So, oops, uh, I did it twice. Okay, so all I wanted to do there was to just kind of put in uh, um, a little uh, um, beginning element there prior to all this. The other thing that is um, important here is the tempo. The tempo happens to be 120 BPM. So, um, and I want to make sure that I have the tempo set. Uh, quite often when something gets sent in multi-track form, they'll send you information. Like if you're not actually getting it within the session itself, if you're just getting the raw files, they'll usually along with the files tell you what the tempo information is. And if not, then you need to calculate what that tempo is, uh, which is, you know, pretty easy to do in most applications. You have something, you know, where you can kind of hit a, uh, a letter T or something like that. That's what it is in, in uh, Pro Tools. You just click on this, take off the conductor, and then just, and then just keep hitting the T key until you get uh, a steady tempo. And then from there, I'm a little spastic here, so. It's enlightening. But I kind of, I'm going back and forth around 120. So 120 ends up being the uh, order of the day. And then I'll set that as the tempo here. Uh, ooh, uh, I'll move together. All right, that's cool. Um, and all that does is it just sets it. So now this is just the, uh, um, now I can use my grid to kind of move and edit things, deal with automation and all of that sort of stuff to, to get things laid out. All right, so uh, let's see. Um, okay, so here there's some uh, a couple of questions here that are coming up on the, on the live chat here. So it's like, should you consider frequency ranges of, of a track group also? Um, oh, okay, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of more into whatever is going on musically. Um, but yeah, a lot of times, uh, parts that maybe are, are similar, but are high frequency instruments might go together. I'm more likely to do instruments that coordinate together in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, like maybe there's like a hi-hat and a shaker kind of play off of each other and they're both, you know, more high frequency instruments. So I might blend them together, but it's more about the fact that they play off of each other necessarily than the frequency response. Sometimes that plays a part, but sometimes you also get a thing where you have, you know, tracks that, you know, where one part is, you know, all the basses and cellos on a string part and the other is all of the, you know, um, you know, the strings, the violas and violins um, on top of it. And you blend those two tracks together. And obviously you would group and put them together because they would be part of, you know, just different elements within the same arrangement. But outside of those obvious things, um, I'm more concerned about how they musically, rhythmically or harmonically belong together. You know, in other words, a lot more of it is in their role because if this string part was very, very high frequency and it's mixing in with a very warm pad, but essentially they're playing off of each other, I'll mix them in together, not necessarily based on the frequency response, um, but the fact that they're performing the same role and maybe that string part is lifting the section, you know, or lifting the vibe or the energy for that particular section. So uh, I think that kind of covers all that I wanted to cover here with this type of stuff. I'm not going to go through the process of creating memory locations, except to say that it's really important that you make markers, especially if it's not uh, a song that you're familiar with. If you're mixing somebody else's material, actually going through and laying in the memory locations, I always like to do it in real time as I go along, um, helps me to map out in my brain what the arrangement is. So there's an introduction there with a guitar and a lead synth. Uh, the kick drum comes in, the vocal starts, um, you know, from an introductory standpoint. Yeah. It's enlightening who we are. So actually this uh, verse part is actually in the wrong location. It should be here. Yeah. It's enlightening who we are. See if it, the Don't rest of it is right. Manual, but together we can use stars. 
are standing just feet apart. That clap is recognizing the part of that loop. When your legs start to give up on you, still run the race. Yeah, it's just what we have to do to just claim the fame. Okay, and let's see if there's like a little bit break here. One thing that, that a lot of people question about is when do they start the marker for a particular section? Um, in my experience, I've always found it best to put it always dead on the downbeat of a section, even if there's sort of a lead in to that section, you know, or there's always some sort of transitional fill or something that carries you over a drum fill or something like that. Um, and sometimes the vocal will start singing prior to the downbeat of that section. I still leave it right dead on the downbeat. If I need to do anything, I can always assign a pre-roll and have a pre-roll up here uh, set up. If I want to, you know, cue up to the verse, I can set a two-bar pre-roll, and then I always get two bars prior to whatever it is. Uh, this actually comes into play a lot more when you get into automation and things like that and skipping around. You should be able to drop it right on the downbeat. Uh, in Pro Tools, it's really easy. If you just set the grid to be one bar, uh, then it'll always land on on the exact bar. So even if you're putting it in in real time, the markers uh, or memory locations, then when you put it in with grid mode, it'll drop them right on the bar. Um, the other thing is that in doing this, I'm going to have it all the way to the end. When we get to the mix, I always add like another one, which is um, a highlighted area for the bounce of the mix, where the start and the end of the bounce will be and kind of get to that in a much later phase. All right, so I think that covers the basics on this end. The next uh, uh, step that's gonna come up is kind of working a bit with the mixed signal flow and organizing uh, the structure of the signal flow, and that's gonna be the next video.